Well, we want to continue to build up on the dating methods here. And I just want to give you some scientific evidences of a young earth to show you that it's not just the dating methods that are supporting the Bible, but there are so many sciences. We're not against science. We're, we love science as creationists. The difference is, as I said, it's that bias that we apply to the data, to the science, that causes us to come up with an interpretation that is either consistent with the Word of God or inconsistent with it. And science can be and is consistent with the Word of God when interpreted properly. So we want to talk about these scientific evidences for a young earth. Now, you might ask, well, who cares, really? Why does it matter if we believe the earth is young or if we believe the earth is old? Who cares? Well, a lot of people do. First of all, I think the credibility of the book of Genesis is at stake here. Because if the earth is millions and billions of years old, then Genesis cannot be correct. It's inaccurate. And I think the average person can read the book of Genesis and understand it. It doesn't take some special you know, guru to, to tell you that this means a day is a day. The other thing is the credibility of Jesus would be at stake because we see that the book of Genesis is quoted by Jesus many times, at least 25 times. Every New Testament author quotes Genesis at least one time. So a book that's considered in Jesus' day to be very important, quoted as historical truth in Jesus' day, today is being laughed at, scoffed at, chewed out, spit up because we don't think that it's accurate. I think that the evolutionists care whether the earth is young or not because if the earth is just 6,000 years old their theory looks silly so they certainly cannot allow themselves to think that way. And as I showed you here in the dating methods that clearly the gospel of Jesus is at stake because if the earth is millions and billions of years old then there was death before man which means Jesus' death on the cross is just natural. It has no meaning. It has no purpose. And he could have stayed up in heaven and said, you're forgiven. Not had to die on the cross. Not had to take the beatings. Not have to do any of those things. So the, the whole idea that Genesis is literal truth is extremely important for the gospel. Now again, I'm not saying you have to believe in creation to be a Christian. The gospel of Jesus is what counts on that. What I'm saying is this, is that when we would go out and evangelize, many, many times we would hear people who would not believe or listen to the gospel simply because they believed that the Bible had already been proven wrong by science. If it's not right in Genesis, why would it be right in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? And so it is an important issue for us to look at. Let's look at this example. Is the sun shrinking? Well, according to our textbooks it is. Do you know since 1836 we have observed through direct visual measurement the sun's diameter. And it is shrinking at a rate of about 0.1% each century or about 5 feet every hour. So in other words, 5 hours ago it should have been 25 feet bigger. The sun is losing mass. It's burning up about 5 million tons per second. That means not long ago the Sun would have absorbed Venus and Mercury. It would have been so big Venus and Mercury would have been gone. Not to mention we would be burning up here as well. Well there's a lot of things here with this Sun. So it not only cannot be that old because it would be too large, we're at a perfect location away from the Sun. Now you go back 6,000 years, no big deal. But a million years, that is a, a big deal. There's also the faint sun paradox. You see, evolution teaches that the sun's power comes from fusion of hydrogen and helium deep into the sun's core. But this is problematic. You see, the sun should brighten, according to evolutionary theory, by 25% after three and a half billion years. So the sun would have been much fainter, only warming the earth to about 31 degrees Fahrenheit three and a half billion years ago. Now keep in mind, they say the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. But yet the fossil record shows the exact opposite. The fossil record says that the sun wasn't fainter back then, but yet we had a very lush vegetation, a wonderful climate. Something's wrong. And I can tell you it's not the Bible. Now we 
looked at carbon dating before, so I'm not going to get into this too much outside of the fact to give you real quickly an understanding here. In the dating methods, we said the carbon dating, radiation comes from the sun, it hits the nitrogen in the atmosphere, then that nitrogen is turned into carbon-14, a radioactive element. In our atmosphere, we have carbon-12, carbon-14. I breathe it in, so the ratio out in the air should be the same that it is in my body. And when I die, I stop eating, I stop breathing, so I stop taking in that carbon-14. It starts leaving my body. So in the dating methods, all they do is they go and measure how much carbon-14 has left the body. Once you stop eating and drinking and taking it in, it has no place to go but out. We talked about in the dating methods that it is forming, carbon-14 is forming 28 to 37 percent faster than it is leaving our atmosphere. We should reach an equilibrium like that tank of water. You put a tank of water there, put a hose in, have holes drilled up the tank. Water will eventually reach an equilibrium that the amount coming in the tank will equal the amount leaving the tank through the holes. Likewise, the amount of carbon-14 coming into our atmosphere should equal the amount leaving the atmosphere in 30,000 years. Yet we have not reached that equilibrium in 4.6 billion years, supposedly. No, this is saying that the Earth can't even be 30,000 years old. And this is why, you know, we are finding carbon in diamonds, as we said, because the half-lifes are not accurate, and the Earth is only about 6,000 years old. Diamonds, which are taking 1 to 3 billion years, they say, to form, shouldn't have any more carbon in them. But it's filled with carbon. This is why, as we said before, that we have living mollusk shells that are 2,300 years old and freshly killed seals 1,300 years dead and so on. Now, since we talked about that in the dating methods, we don't need to get into that here again. But you do need to understand that that is evidence of a young Earth. Now, if you'd like more information on the dating methods as well, you can get this book here, The Mythology of Modern Dating Methods, or our uh, DVD from the Answers in Genesis called The Geology Set, which will give you a lot more if you're interested. Anyway, we can also look at this question. Was the Earth ever a hot, molten mass? Well, our textbooks say it was. Here we see Holt Earth Science, and we can see many, many more. Uh, any current science textbook today will tell you this, for the most part. As the Earth formed, I'll say, the Earth's surface was hot, and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Now, what I find interesting about that is that lines right up with Genesis, doesn't it? Right there in Genesis 1-1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the Earth, and the Earth was formless and empty, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the hot molten magma. <laughs> yeah. No, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, right? Yeah, the waters. You see, evolution and the Bible are not consistent in any way, shape, or form. We need to choose which one you're going to follow, God and His Word or man and His fallible wisdom. So anyway... They're saying that the earth started out as this molten magma. They say that granite would be taking millions of years for it to cool down. We talked about those polonium halos in the dating methods. I want to give you a little bit more information here. There's a book here called Creation's Tiny Mystery by Robert Gentry. Now, Robert Gentry discovered these things in granite, like we said, but the difference is, is he believed that this was created rocks. We now believe that that's not the case. However, these polonium halos have been a gold mine for discrediting the half-life being constant in rocks, as we talked about before. That's very important. So, as you can see these halos, as I mentioned before, it's like a firecracker. But if you would stick a firecracker and throw it in a, you know, a pond or some kind of water, it leaves an energy signature initially. However, that energy signature goes away because it's, you know, liquid. If it's thicker mud, it stays. But molten magma wouldn't stay. It would be like water, just thicker water. It would leave a signature and then it would go away. And so these polonium halos should not be left in granite. Now we explained how they formed in the dating methods. A little complicated, maybe not too exciting to hear, but it's important to understand. But what Gentry thought was that it was evidence that God created the world, 
like that because it had a half-life of a thousandth of a second that granites must have formed that quickly. We now see that there does seem to be a better explanation, but nonetheless it's saying that these polonium halos had to form still quickly in a matter of hours to days, not millions of years. The other problem is with granites, when granites slowly cool down, they have small crystals in them. The faster it cools down, the larger the crystals that are found in them. Today, granite is filled with large crystals, suggesting it did not cool down slowly over millions of years like what we're being taught in our textbooks. This is evidence of a young Earth. Helium, where is the helium? Helium does not combine with other atoms. It diffuses out, it escapes into the atmosphere. So really all of it should have leaked out of the atmosphere in less than 10,000 years. Yet the rocks are still filled with helium. 58% of helium is still present in zircon crystals. And so basically with the present observational studies that we see of how helium escapes out of rocks today, the earth is 6,000 years old exactly plus or minus 2,000 years. Now by the way, that was a, a prediction that was made that if the earth is young, the Bible says it should be 6,000 years. They didn't go out seeking this. The evidence just fit it perfectly. So critics said, well, helium must have been bottled up somehow, you know, locked up in a glass bottle somehow in these rocks. No, because it is wedged between flat mica sheets. Now, if you've seen mica, it's like layered, very porous, uh, you know, you can go right through the layers. Therefore, that is a terrible uh, rescue device to try and say that helium was bottled up. How about population statistics? This is one of my favorites. You know, they say in 1999, they said the world's population topped 6 billion people. Today we are at 7 billion people. It is continuing to grow very quickly. From 1999, 6 billion to now 7 billion already. Population statistics grow very slowly at first, but then it grows exponentially, skyrockets. I always tell kids, I said, if you guys want to get rich, here's what you need to do. Uh, you go home and you ask your parents tonight, I hope they're not here, you ask your parents, you know, mom, dad, can I maybe stop getting an allowance? Maybe some of you don't get an allowance, but if you do, say, you know, I would like to stop getting an allowance, at least as much as I'm getting right now. All I want is to get one penny a week. That's it, just one penny a week, and I'll be happy. Now, because I do want to you know, buy some gum from time to time, how about this? How about every week, though, we double it? So you know, next week, we'll get two cents. And the week after that, just four. And the week after that, just eight cents, OK? And, and, and all I want to do is let's just do this for one year. 52 weeks, we'll call it good. Sound like a pretty good deal? No? Well, it's a pretty good deal, believe me. Here's the thing, it does, it starts out slow. That's how population is. You know, two people can only have a couple of kids, and then those couple of kids, now you got four that can have kids, and then you got eight that can have kids for a while, and so on. Look at this, you get one cent, two cents, four cents, eight cents, 16, 32, 64, a buck 28, we'll call it a dollar 25 to make it easy, 250, five dollars in 10 weeks. You've been working two and a half months, and all you're getting is five dollars a week which probably sounds pretty good to my kids, but $5 a week isn't that much. And that's just after 10 weeks. But after that, then it goes to $10, $20, $40, $80, $160, $320, $640. I mean, this is getting pretty impressive. We'll just call it $600 again, $1,200 a week. $2,400 a week. That's just after 20 weeks. You're not even through a half a year yet. Yeah, $2,400, $4,800. And then you're getting, you know, just rounding it, $10,000, 20, $20,000, $40,000, $80,000, $160,000, $320,000. the time you are done with a year, you are going to be billionaires every week. And your parents are going to be put in the poorhouse. 
That's the way human population is. Look at this textbook here. It says in 1810, there were one billion people. I want you to see I'm not making this stuff up. This is stuff that they're teaching in our schools. And I believe this is true. A billion people in 1810. But today, seven billion. But because of this rapid population growth, what they're doing in our schools is they're teaching your kids that you don't want to have too many kids, you know, one or two at most, because the world is getting overpopulated. It's the overpopulation myth. It is a myth. The world is not overpopulated. Do you know that Jacksonville, Florida has over 25 billion square feet? And there's only 7 billion people on Earth. Not the United States. Earth. That means the entire world's population could fit in Jacksonville, Florida. There's a lot more land in the world than there is in Florida, let alone Jacksonville. Now granted, you know, that would be crowded. You know, you each get about three square feet. But, nonetheless, if it's overcrowded where you're living, can I make a suggestion? Move! There's plenty of land in Colorado, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, let alone other countries, other continents. Yeah, it's not overcrowded. That is a population myth. Now, if evolution were true, however, and people have been here the last 100,000 years, then it would be overpopulated. You see, there should be 150,000 people per square inch. Yeah, you ought to be able to pick up a handful of dirt and have human bones everywhere in there. But we don't see that. Why? Because the earth isn't that old and people haven't been here 100,000 years. It's young about 6,000 years old. We also see that there was a recent explosion of human diversity. Genetic studies have been done to find out how long it would take to get the current diversity with the current genes that we have today. And research shows here, done here in Tennessee, that the maximum likelihood for accelerated growth is 5,115 years to get the diversity we have in human, generation, in human population today. 5,100 years. That sounds awfully close to the Bible, doesn't it? Yet that's what genetics is showing. Not only that, but we have seen recently that most DNA mutations have come about in the last 2,000 years. The University of Washington, they did a study and they showed that 91% of harmful mutations emerged in the last 5,000 years. Alan Keenan of Cornell University said, humans today carry a much larger load of deleterious variants than our species carried just prior to its massive expansion just a couple hundred generations ago. We're falling apart. And that's exactly what not only the Bible says, but the second law of thermodynamics would say. But the fact is that it's happened in the last 2,000 years is, is very important. Because if people have been here for 100,000 years, by now, we ought to be a mess. Far more than what we are today. Because of DNA just deteriorates. We also see with population statistics, there was a lady in New Zealand. In December of 1984, she was 112 years old and she had 450 descendants. The interesting thing about that is World Book Encyclopedia says that there was a growth rate of about 1.8% which is basically doubling the population every 39 years. Back in 1650, there were 600 million people on the earth. 1950, 2,400 million. That means that, according to observational science, that the population doubled every 150 years. A little different than what World Book Encyclopedia said. But, nonetheless, doubling every 150 years. What's fascinating about that fact is this. The World Book of Knowledge says there are 200 million Arabs and 18 million Jews. So if you take the time from the time of Abraham, that means the population for the Arabs have doubled every 150 years. Exactly. Now the Jews, they doubled every 182 years, which makes sense because the Jews have been persecuted throughout history with the pogroms, the Holocaust, all of that, so it's taken them a little longer to double. But nonetheless, what we see in observational science, the facts are saying population statistics double 
about every 150 years. Well, the population that we have today at 7 billion means it only doubles 29 and a half times. That means it doubled every 152 years, which is exactly what we see in observational science. That the current population today has exactly what the statistics say is supposed to happen if the Earth is about 4,400 years old. Now you say, wait a minute. I thought you said the Earth was 6,000 years old. It is, but what happened 4,400 years ago? Ah, Noah's flood, and it started over again, didn't it? Exactly. Now, by the way, evolutionists have to do something with this. Why don't we see all the human bones, too? Based on DNA studies, scientists are now putting forth that the, there was a catastrophe of some sort about 70,000 years ago that reduced the human population to just a few thousand people. So it created a genetic bottleneck, they proposed, that some kind of volcano did that. I think it was some kind of Noah's flood and not 70,000 years ago, but about 4,400 years ago. Just makes sense. But the world is out there saying you're overpopulated. People here like Jacques Cousteau said that we must stabilize the population of the world and eliminate 350,000 people per day to do so. Yeah. Charles Worcester, he was the Environmental Defense Fund a guy. He said people are the cause of all the problems. We have too many of them. We need to get rid of some of them. And this, speaking on the ban of DDT, is as good of a way as any. Isn't that something? Here on the platform for the United Nations Urban Ecological Summit held in Istanbul, Turkey, way back in 1996, there was a convention and they said that we must either reduce the Earth's human population to one billion or reduce the standard of living to an agrarian peasant status. Sounds like a communistic socialistic philosophy. Exactly. And that is intentional. Because you see, they're believing that we are overpopulated. But the Bible says, no, God will take care of us. Yeah, there's plenty of land, there's plenty of food. It's greed that causes, you know, famines and things like that. Peter Singer, he is a professor at Princeton who favors killing babies. He used to favor them killing them up to 28 days old out of the womb. He now even says up to six months you ought to be able to kill them. Yeah, and this is a guy that can teach your children if you send them off to Princeton. Isn't that nice? He says Christianity is our foe. If animal rights is to succeed, we must destroy the Judeo-Christian religious tradition. Guys, we can't live in our little shells thinking that this kind of thing isn't being preached and taught out there to our kids. It is. We're being lied to. All over the place. We have here Alan Gregg from the Rockefeller Foundation says the world has a cancer and the cancer is man. Isn't that nice? Or Ted Turner, you know, he used to be on CNN. He says a total world population of 250 to 300 million people or a 95% decline from present levels would be ideal. Yeah, that is the goal of the New World Order. That is the goal of the United Nations, to reduce the world's population. Because in order to have control over you, they need to have less of you. And I know that sounds all conspiracy theory-like, but guys, just do some research. It's there. You can go to Elberton, Georgia, on Highway 77, and just 100 yards off the road, out in the field, we have what are called the Georgia Guidestones. And on those stones, they have what are called the Ten Commandments of the New Age. And what you see, this is what they look like here. There are these Ten Commandments obviously mimicking the Ten Commandments of Scripture, but certainly not in content. Number one is to maintain humanity under a half billion people in perpetual balance with nature. These stones are filled with Masonic symbols, and by the way, nobody knows who put this up. Some guy anonymously in a suit came in to give the money for it, to have it built, and gave a false name, all of that. We don't know where the money came from or who it is. But the other interesting thing is this county has one of the highest divorce rates and crime rates of the country. And it's just a little dinky town, little dinky county. Go Google the Georgia Guidestones and read up on that a little bit. It's very interesting. But 
All of these things, we, we fulfilled about eight of these Ten Commandments already, ultimately. You know, abolishing private property and restricting uh, the rights to have arms, you know, bear guns, things like that. So anyway, uh, that is the goal of the New World Order. But regardless of the future, the current population shows that the population started around 4,400 years ago. And that is exactly and perfectly in line with what the scriptures say. How about astronomy? I love this part too, astronomy. You know, astronomers have observed supernovas and they have observed about every 30 years a star blows up in what is called a supernova. If the universe is billions of years old, as evolutionists are trying to tell you, we should have several hundred million of these things out there that we can see. But in fact, less than 300 have been observed. That would indicate that the earth is young, not 4.6 billion years old. Not only that, but they'll try and tell you that we see stars forming today. How many of you guys have gone out at night, looked up at the Big Dipper and thought, wow, I see another star there. It's the really Big Dipper. No, you've never seen that, have you? Why? Because we don't see stars forming. Now I know, some of you might be, oh yes, we do. We, we've got this one out here, uh, out there in that constellation right there, that, that, that's a star forming. Oh, you mean that ball of gas? Yeah, 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 that ball of, oh, no, that's a ball of gas that you believe is a star forming. You see, actually seeing a star form and believing you're seeing a star form can be two completely different things. It could be dust clearing, a star showing behind or, or you know, coming through gas. But we've never seen stars form. But our textbooks tell us it happens. Our textbooks tell us that red giant stars evolve into white dwarf stars over billions of years. My question would be this. Now, is that your opinion or is that based on observational science? Because there's not a scientist out in the world that can prove that. I can prove it's wrong. They can't prove it's happening. How can I prove it's wrong? History. Do you know that we have historical records from Egypt? The Egyptian hieroglyphs from 2000 BC tell us that Sirius was a red star. Even in 50 BC, we see Cicero stepping in and telling us that Sirius was red. Seneca tells us it was redder than Mars. Ptolemy in 150 AD said it was one of the six red stars. Yeah, but you know that today it is a white binary star? Now wait a minute, our textbook said that's supposed to take place over billions of years, yet from 150 AD to today it's happened. They're wrong, people. They are wrong. And by the way, I don't even think the sun is a star. We say, well, the sun is a star. Why? Because then the stars can be suns. And those stars can be suns for other planets. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not denying that the sun has some of the same makeup as stars. But the only reason you believe the sun is a star is because it's what the astronomers are telling you because they see through spectrograms and things like that, spectrographs, they see uh, the same kind of gases. Well, guess what? We're made of the same kind of stuff animals are too, but we're very different. Besides, in Genesis, the Bible tells me that God also made the stars separate from the sun for whole different reasons. We also see in 1 Corinthians 15, it's talking about the makeup of, of flesh, of animals and people and how it's different. And then it goes on and it even says the stars are different than the sun. And stars differ from one another. And some people, well, it's talking about brightness. No, look at the context. It's not talking about brightness. It's talking about makeup here. And so the, the, the sun is not a star, despite what you've been taught. That's based on a secular worldview, not a biblical one. But the secular world will also tell you that the, these stars are forming to replace those that have burned out. And the ones that are forming are blue. They say that hydrogen gas collapses under their own gravity to form this new star. So hydrogen gas keeps collapsing in. Any of you work with gases? You know that can't be true. Gases resist compression. 